Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So Information in Mind is an initiative um, that is formed as a think tank and a do tank that explores the impact of technology on our lives. And our recent efforts are um, put towards uh, the impact on uh, the mind. So this afternoon, we're going to try to answer the question, is mind change the new climate change? Um, Let's start with a brief history about the relationship of man and machine, basically with a deterministic uh, uh, approach uh, asking, is our technology uh, defining our societies? And um, let's go to a pivotal point, which is uh, 12,000 years ago, um, what one uh, uh, is, uh, can define as the first agricultural revolution. Now, what's interesting in that revolution that um, it redefined the relationship between man and nature. So no longer we reliant on nature to provide rain and, and food, and then we can just be hunters gatherers taking what we find. That's the moment where as uh, a tribe becoming a society, we can control nature and use uh, various technologies like uh, water technologies, food preservation, fertilizations, and all kind of uh, 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 techniques that enabled us to create abundance of food and effectively starting societies that uh, uh, one can determine as the beginning of uh, a social being of the human uh, race. Now, the interesting point about that move where man can control his uh, environment is the birth of the humanistic notion where man is above nature and above the animals. Now, obviously man is not the strongest, not uh, uh, the fastest, doesn't have the best eyesight or hearing or smell, uh, but still the idea that the human being is the center of, of the universe leads to an interesting uh, uh, hierarchical relationship that we can use nature, we can use animal kingdom for our good needs, and effectively, perhaps we have the rights also to destroy nature. So um, with this in mind, um, I look at that line, this very, very uh, 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 general kind of process of the moment where we start to have control of our environment as the revolution, which I call the hardware revolution, where physically, we are interacting differently with our environment. I'm going to talk now about another revolution, which goes 5,000 years ago, and that's the revolution of the invention of script writing. Now, that's probably, you know, the, the information, the first, the beginning of the information revolution, the way we store information and the way we distribute information had such a dramatic impact on humanity that uh, a few uh, thousands of years later, Socrates basically says, writing destroys memory and knowledge, it weakens the mind, relieves it of work, and makes it uh, uh, work that makes it strong. Writing is an inhumane thing. So no, we're not talking about the state of the net, we're talking about the beginning of script, and there's already such a pessimistic view of what information is going to do to us. Um, Obviously, he's referring to the, the, the shift from oral tradition, where you had to come together, listen to the wise, and uh, information has a much more immediate relationship with the person that generates the information. Um, another milestone is obviously several thousand years later, which is just last 500 years or 500 years ago, where information is democratized even further. So the print revolution, making information more accessible and more mass uh, distributed, and the, 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 uh, the, the notion that the invention and spread of printing press are widely regarded as among the most influential events in human history, basically pushing forward modernity as, as we know it. So these are kind of very sporadic points that uh, uh, I like to point out in terms of the history and the relationship man has with the tools he developed. So, how are we going to consider that revolution? 200, uh, 2,500 2, years ago, years, no, 2,500 days ago, we have iPhone 1 coming, effectively completing the di digital revolution, 
Uh, with that move, we are connected to everybody and we are connected to all information. And it doesn't matter how big the screens from that point are going to be, how small, how much they're going to be in our retina, in our ear, doesn't matter. But this basically starts the post-digital world. And from that point, obviously, we have to see what do we do with this connectivity. And that's what a lot of people are trying uh, to understand. So the impact this has on the human uh, takes us from the hardware, which I described with uh, um, the agricultural revolution, to the software, which is the revolution of information. So the place to explore that is obviously the human mind. So let's see a bit um, how our mind is, is made of. Basically, when you are born, you're born with a set amount of brain cells. Now, what happens for the point from the first day of your life, the experiences, the sensorial experiences, sight, smell, taste, hearing, all these sensorial experiences start to make connections between these cells, okay? And these connections, these are the, the things that make us who we are. They're unique, so even when you have twins, you know, they have complete, or they might have different uh, sensorial input and form a, an individual set of brain and what is called uh, brain plasticity. So the brain, brain physically changes and becomes what we can consider a self with these connections that are made minute by minute, second by second. Now, our reality and the screen reality that we are living in creates a complete new environment, basically a two-dimensional one. As much as we want to talk about the rich media of sound, video, text, and, and real time, it is still a two-dimensional environment. Now, with this two-dimensional environment, we're missing out a lot of sensorial input, which is crucial for a healthy development of the brain. And recent research is basically talking that we have clear evidence that these type of interactions, these type of uh, reduced interactions and reduced stimuli are affecting our brains and it's physically changing it into what uh, we can consider an uh, unprecedented change. Now, there's many aspects to look into this. I want to touch a couple of them. Maybe we'll continue in the discussion. And uh, I'm going to talk about human interaction. Very important, right? Social media is supposed to connect us and we can uh, uh, have uh, uh, um, uh, someone that we met uh, a week ago connect and, and someone that you know from kindergarten uh, approach you and we can connect in various ways we could not imagine. But human interaction and the impact of human interaction is only 10% what one would say the verbal or the textile or the words. So much is about eye contact, body language, then you have pheromones and and physical contact, voice has a lot of impact. And social networks don't have these kind of inputs. They just don't create and don't co contain the complexity of human interaction. So um, we experience new phenomena. So when we connect so much to, to screen technologies, we all know about FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, NOMO is like when you go out of your house without your mobile phone, this is a certain kind of anxiety, phantom buzzes, walking in the street, feeling that, you know, uh, 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 this excited experience of social networks create this uh, uh, tendency to be hyper alert, and uh, we have mechanisms of releasing tensions. Now, all this is related to a very interesting mechanism of the brain. The father of the hum hormonal uh, 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 um, uh, materials that the brain, the neurohormonal activities, is related to a, a, a trait which is called seeking. So when we are uh, uh, seeking for information, the moment we consume information, we have this nectar uh, which is called dopamine. It's a quick reward system that consuming any information, no matter what information, it releases dopamine. Okay, so when you have now your phone buzzing, you cannot not read the information that's coming in. This is uh, completely evolutionary explained. When you go in the jungle, you need to know this is a lion, this is a fruit, and we constantly seek it out, and it doesn't matter what information we are evolutionary uh, uh, supposed to consume it. So um, that explains why we're so much attracted to, to the screens. 
Um, I won't get into too much details, but it really relates to a certain kind of feedback loop where uh, that's where we all experience this uh, uh, element of going to the net, looking uh, for a book that we just want to buy, and we just plan to go for five minutes, and we end up one hour. There's not a single person anywhere that does not experience that. The tendency to lose our, our uh, sense of time is completely related to the fact that any pop-up of information just completely seduces us in there, and we consume that without much control. Let's go back to social interactions. So if human interaction has to do so much with the analog aspects of body language, eye contact, our new generation, which makes his social interactions only through screen technology, doesn't practice, does not practice these ways of interactions. And what is now widely understood uh, to be a very important uh, uh, aspect of reducing uh, the amount of empathy between people. You can bully someone on the other side of the world, or maybe just even not in the same room, but he's on the net. You do not see his reaction on the face. Um, important articles in Scientific American uh, have actually data on this. And, um, and let's see what we do get on the net. So if we talk about attention, we all know the situation where a kid comes to mom and says, hey, mom, look, here's a sock. And as, as a mother or a father, you come and say, oh, great, lovely sock, well done. And, and that's a very basic need for attention of kids getting an acknowledgement, uh, an adult looking in the eyes and saying, I see you are here, you are present, you are alive. Now, what happens on social networks, basically the, 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 the depth of compassionate listening, listening to someone, hearing out all his problems, just being there, asking a question, reaching the depth of processing the emotional aspects of an experience is reduced to like, not like, a joke, one-liner. And the fact that we desperately are seeking for, for this attention is almost like the same kid-like wish for attention. And then one would argue is, is probably leading to this existential a crisis of adults kind of getting information and getting attention from such trivial uh, means as a yes, no, and, uh, and a red button with how many likes. Now, our generation of, uh, uh, is, is unprecedentedly medicated for ADD and ADHD, which is basically a deficit of attention. Now, we're not going to go in depth into that, but basically, uh, uh, modernity and modern life re produced a generation that probably didn't get enough attention and, um, and our generation nowadays, which is in a way just has begun to use social media. It hasn't really grown up on it uh, as much as the next generation. And the question is, what kind of deficit are we cooking for the next generation? And um, the big question is, is it inevitable? Right? We heard lovely uh, uh, talks before explaining, uh, yeah, privacy is a complex thing, right? Uh, but what can we do? We just have to give it up, or we should put borders. Uh, we try to think and, and try to imagine what could it be. And, and that's an interesting question, because um, we all sort of agree that there's no going back, right? We just go forward. You know, when you read Socrates' lines, it's... it's uh, uh, it's kind of quite ridiculous. I mean, look, look at the wonderful thing, text, uh, and, and, and writing, and sharing information, and many times we feel the same with uh, technologies around us. But, um, but I believe that the, 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 the speed, the speed that we adopt technologies, the speed that we adopt new social habits, uh, um, have to put a big question mark on how we operate. Now, Education is very big for me. I lead an art and media department in an art school, uh, but I have all kinds of social projects with uh, uh, teenagers and, and younger uh, uh, children, and I just see that there's a lot of opportunities to address a lot of the big questions, for example, that the education system is, is, is dealing with. For example, the big tension between the virtual world and the classroom, right? 
virtual world. So much more interesting. You get the best lectures, the best uh, information, um, what interests you. And the classroom is so linear, so analog. How do you, you uh, meet that, uh, that tension? And at that point, you know, uh, um, I think if we all go back, and none of us remember 99% of what we learned in high school, right? We all did the exams, we succeeded more or less, but we don't remember nothing. But I think if every one of you remembers that significant teacher, that one teacher, maybe two, not more, not more but you do have that one adult that inspired you. We're gonna talk about passion soon, and, and, and that passion comes many times from the idea and from the presence of that significant adult. So no matter how uh, intense social media, e-learning, uh, uh, new uh, ideas of engaging technology for education, the significant adult, this inspiration, that moment where an adult is looking in the eyes of, 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 of a child, believing in him, is something that we cannot uh, uh, underestimate. And I believe that in my think tank, and which we are developing programs uh, uh, as an opportunity to take uh, the steering wheel in hand and say, okay, we have a lot of the forces driven by information uh, corporations. Um, let's make kind of a multi-systemic overview. Let's talk about information ideology. Let's talk about various impacts and make it kind of an information society project that uh, we have to be faster than the education system more independent than the corporation and, and the corporate world, and, uh, but use media for promoting these ideas. Um, so, so that's information in mind, and I like um, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring a, a very, another quote, which is by Paul Valerian, 1919, and it goes like this. Interruption, incoherence, surprise are the ordinary conditions of our lives. They have even become real needs for many people whose minds are no longer fed by anything by sudden changes and constantly renewed stimuli. We can no longer bear anything that lasts. We no longer know how to make boredom bear fruit. And then he asks the ultimate question, can the human mind master what the human mind has made? And, uh, and obviously, this is from 1919. So the question is obviously not digital technology, it's modernity itself. Uh, I discussed, you know, uh, some of the panelists from the privacy uh, uh, session about uh, um, the benefits that we get from giving parts of our humanness away for the benefits of the system. It's a major question. Can we decide, you know, what do we keep and what do we uh, agree to, to give away? And I think this is something that we can discuss later on in the panel, the aspect of boredom. And this is, is something, a very interesting mechanism that I want to uh, finish with. And it goes like this. Um, being a father of two kids, um, we all experience you know, the, the low threshold of tolerance, uh, of, of frustration, sorry. And, and, and they get frustrated very quick. And as, as a parent, you, you really want to help them you know, get the inner power to overcome uh, a lot of the, their anxieties and you know the difficult difficult things they experience and uh, and there was a little aha moment that I had a very direct uh, correlation between understanding how the mechanism of children work in in, in a broader sense as a society and it goes like this um, modern parents you know that we're very consciousness we all went to therapy and we want to be very very attentive we know that there's a deficit uh, of attention and we try to address that. And uh, when uh, the moment a kid has a certain problem, he has a little bit of uh, dirt on his, on his, around his mouth. So, you know, five parents is, jump and clean it up, and yeah, we're, we're, we're doing a great job. But then I think the modern parent is the most frustrated parent ever because he, uh, he, he provides for his kid. He, he takes him to, to swim when he's, you know, two, two and a half months old, and, and he has all these terrific things that he gives the kid, but the kid is still cannot... Uh, 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 is still expressing a lot, a lot of fr frustration, right? We, uh, we, we buy him the iPad, we give him an iPhone, and still he finishes the time on, on the screen, and he's not grateful. He's completely frustrated and wired up. And then I realized one thing. Uh, the, the screen effect, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, um, uh, at this point, I'm talking in a very basic 
mechanism of solving the kid's problem. As parents, the moment the kid, our children, express a slight sense of discomfort, we immediately solve it. And that aha moment was that basically my job is not to solve my, my children's problem. I need to let them go through frustration, experiencing it, not going to any quick reward, which is uh, sugar, um, screen, because we know now dopamine releases you know, a quick reward. Uh, um, just be in this frustration. I, I'll be there, you know, I have to calm myself because he's screaming and I have to work on my mechanism not to go to, to my screen. But with that mechanism in mind, you let the kid experience going through frustration and sometimes interesting things happen. Maybe he finds inner power to, to overcome that frustration and that's the human empowerment that I'm talking about in, 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 in a very saturated uh, environment of, of media. Now, basically, technology solves problems that we pose as a society, as individuals. And if I ask you, uh, is, your, is your internet connection fast enough? Is your iPhone fast enough? You'll never feel that it solves the problem fast enough. Um, and I think, in whole, as a society, the idea that every problem, there's an app for that, every bit of time that we have when we spend waiting for a train or for a flight, we immediately start consuming information because we still don't have this as a, as a, as a, kind of as a known paradigm that it is like consuming other quick reward uh, 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 substances like you know, sugar, fat, and salt. Um, we create a, a society that I call is, is driven by techno compulsion. This compulsion of not being, not being bored is something that I think we have to look at and, and try to address beyond the, the question of how much time you're on Facebook uh, and beyond you know, what is it doing uh, 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 to our kids on the very immediate level. It's much more the question of ideology and understanding the basic uh, 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 qualities that uh, uh, make us human. So thank you very much, and I uh, hope to engage in uh, your questions and the panel.